Julian Sevalescu, can I call you Julian? Sure. Um, uh, I'm a biohacker, so I'm wondering in your work as an academic, uh, do you uh, come across the term biohacking more and more or, or is it still in acad academic terms still a, 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 a word which is not very much used? Yeah, you know, I, I've, uh, I'm familiar with the term biohacking and, and I have a friend who's a biohacker. Uh, so the, I, I think there's the famous biohacker Josiah. Zainer. Zainer, yeah. that's right, that's been injecting uh, in, in gene editing into yeah. his muscles, which I, I don't think has really had any effect, but maybe you can <laughs> tell me whether it has. But um, uh, No, I heard it hadn't had the effect he, he hoped for. He wants to be more muscular. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm a biohacker in the sense that I have a chip implanted which is also a, a, a sub part of, of biohackers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've seen the ones for magnetic fields. Yeah. And, yeah very impressive. What's your chip do? Uh, it now has, a, you can see it here. It has, a, it's my contact information on it. I saw my Bitcoin wallet on it. But in the coming weeks, I have another chip, which I can pay at, at the shop. So I just like do this. I think that's, that's even more practical. That's a real, real biohack, I think. Um, but what I, in, uh, regarding terminology, something I still struggle with is, maybe you know it, what's the difference between human enhancement and biohacking? Do you have a sharp... Uh, well, I think that um, human enhancement is a much broader term um, that is used to embrace, you know, enhancing human performance or well-being using a whole variety of technologies, you know, ranging from genetic technologies to... You know, include chips um, and, uh, you know, drugs and, and transcranial electrical stimulation, surgery, um, whereas I take biohacking to, to be, um, I mean, I guess it is the integration of technology, but it, it for me, has more connotations with, with cyborgs and the integration of technology, you know, wholesale. Into, into the body or connections directly with technology. So, you know, typically it's been about, you know, using chips to give us you know, new powers or new, new capacities that we haven't had. So, I mean, I think that, you know, the sort of stuff that, that um, Josiah is doing, you know, I would just put that down to sort of self-experimentation using genetic technology. I think, you know, typically biohacking yeah, well, for me anyway, it's been more about more solid state technologies, but you're the expert. What, what is the difference? <laughs> well, I think you, you had, had a nice definition where you say human enhancement is way broader. So it's all kinds of improving us as mankind. And biohacking, I think it's more on experimental technologies. Yeah. The biohacker really like to try things out which are maybe not... Uh, scientifically or technological validated, but they go yeah. ahead and yeah. they're more yeah. human guinea pigs. So, right. Yeah, yeah. Kevin yeah. Warwick was another sort of mm. famous yeah. biohacker. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned a couple of uh, enhancement technologies, as I might say, like like uh, like uh, uh, electronic uh, current on your head and drugs, etc. What do you find at the moment, 2019, the most promising of all these fields? Well, promising again needs to be defined. Um, if you if you talk about, you know, which of them has the greatest potential for change, um, I think um, I think basically gene editing and, and artificial intelligence are the sort of going to be the biggest game changers. Um, you know, there's only I think you know the capacity with pharmaceuticals or with um, surgery um, is going to be much more limited to this to the sort of stuff that we have now um, but if you're talking about probability or you know probability multiplied by value as promising you know then I think you know you might have to go back to sort of pharmaceuticals we already know that there are effective human enhancers in terms of um, physical enhancement so that that's been sort of well documented the, the sort of benefits of testosterone, growth hormone, and the EPO have in physical performance. Um, and, you know, there, are, there has been some progress in terms of cognitive enhancement. You know, drugs like modafinil and Ritalin that, that do enhance aspects of cognitive performance. And that's going to be sort of much more 
tractable in the short term than than gene editing. But you know, in in the long term, I think rewriting the the, the kind of human genome. <laughs> So there goes some uh, yeah. enhancement <laughs> um, is going to be the sort of you know there's you know really because I mean, we could introduce genes into human beings that humans have never had before genes from non-human animals or perhaps even plants and give humans capacities that they've never had before yeah uh, or even you know immortality there are you know there's a, a, a jellyfish called Turoptosis or something like that, utriculus, it's immortal. So, you know, I think that the, the kind of stakes are extremely high. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're talking about uh, immortality, then we, we discussed it before the, 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 the recording started. For me, that's also more gaining towards transhumanism. Do you like to call yourself a transhumanist? Well, I don't call myself a transhumanist, but you know, maybe I am. I, I haven't really delved into the depths of transhumanism much. But, um, but, you know, in, in general, transhumanism is a movement united by certain sorts of values and ideology and, and, and is, you know, often, you know, like any movement, sort of quite fanatical. And I'm sort of naturally a person who doesn't like to be part of groups or sort of ideologies <laughs> or religions. Um, so, I, you know, I don't see myself as a transhumanist, but, you know, I think many of the, we, we intersect in, you know, our interest in human enhancement and our belief that, you know, the, hu the human animal is not at its final point and that there are various ways in which it could be improved and should be improved. Um, and technology such as genetics or, you know, the integration of brain-computer interfaces, um, you know, is, is inevitable and that we need to, to harness it, you know, to, for, for, for good rather than, than evil. Much of the ethicists I read in interviews or that I also interview are a little more conservative concerning human enhancement. What was the first moment in your, I don't know, childhood or student life or in your academic uh, career when you um, kind of resembled, well, wow, this, I'm, I have a different stake regarding human enhancement, if con contrary to the um, general, um, uh, how do you say, general opinion in the field? Well, I mean, I guess there are sort of two, you know, one was um, when in the late 90s when the Human Genome Project was sort of taking off and, and you know, there were the discussion of, you know, advancing the discovery of genes for, for diseases and intellectual disability. It became obvious to me that not only could you do that, and, and I began to understand that of the genetic contribution um, to intelligence, that, you know, you could also be selecting within the normal range and that this distinction between, you know, what is a disease, it's 2%, you know, of the bottom function. Um, it's just an arbitrary distinction and that there were significant disadvantages that accrued to some aspects of normal, normal function and that science was giving us the, you know, opportunity to, to influence that and, and you know, I, my, part of my PhD was on well-being and part of it was on rationality and autonomy and the obstacles to those. And it was obvious to me that there were various inherent obstacles both to autonomy and well-being and that, you know, genetics was starting to offer the opportunity for overcoming them. And then I looked at what was happening in sports and it was obvious to me that there was a lot of doping in the late 90s, um, cycling and <laughs> athletics and, and that, you know, human enhancement worked it worked you could measure mm. the effect of human enhancement especially and, in sports yeah yeah and then i i you know i you know, started to have this revelation that not only could you enhance cognition not only could you enhance you know sporting performance but you could enhance any aspect of human function and, and existence so then i started to write about enhancement of love i didn't write so much about mood because people had already done that but and then you know the last bit was to to, to sort of look at moral enhancement which was the, you know, improvement of moral behaviour using biological uh, or bio-enhancement. Yeah, I, you also made a, um, or gave a TED talk about that in Barcelona, which I uh, viewed. Uh, I will come back to the morality uh, later, but I'm curious uh, because, um, uh, well, when you say human enhancement, a lot of people think about the direct positive influence it had, is, will have on an individual. But you also stated in one of the lectures I saw online 
that it also is beneficial to society. For example, if you have an uh, increase of IQ of society as a whole, uh, poverty goes down, uh, violence goes down, etc. cetera. Um, uh, but another, f- so I think that's great, but another feeling I get is, doesn't it uh, violate free will, et cetera, those kinds of things. Is this also a pushback you get a lot? Yeah, a lot of people fear enhancement will undermine human freedom, and, and it could. And I think this is another sort of general aspect of practical ethics. You know, people want to have a kind of simple mantra uh, that one thing is good or bad, you know. And if, but even if you take something like killing, is killing, um, you know, an innocent person wrong? Well, you, almost always, but, you know, if it's necessary to save the world, it might not be wrong in some cer- circumstance. So, you know, it, it, you know, human enhancement could undermine freedom. So if you did put chips in people's brains that determined their intentions and their actions uh, and they had no control over those chips or, you know, deep brain stimulators that forced people to eat. So, for example, deep brain stimulation is used to treat anorexia. Mm. Then that would undermine freedom. But, you know, it could also be used to promote freedom. So if you're having obsessive thoughts or compulsions to diet that deep brain stimulation kind of relieves then it could be promoting the the freedom of an anorexic to you know realize their values so for example if you improved empathy with a genetic modification or a drug in my view that would not undermine freedom it would make a person more like somebody who's already more empathetic Um, that's different to, um, for example, you know, inserting a gene that causes a person to relentlessly work on the task that they've got mm. without the ability to resist in a compulsive way. Um, so I think whether enhancement liberates us or imprisons us really depends on the specific enhancement, the way it's used. So to give you another example, um, Ritalin, the drug, um, used the sort of amphetamine-derived drug that's used to treat attention deficit disorder, um, has been shown to reduce violent reoffence in criminals in Sweden who have attention deficit disorder by 30%. And so that's a fantastic sort of moral effect for society. But it also enables that individual to have larger long-term rewards rather than going for a short-term reward or reacting to emotions impulsively and and committing violent acts. So it promotes their well-being and also promotes their autonomy. I think Riddle in that case enhances the individual's freedom. Um, So, you know, I think that whether it undermines or promotes enhancement will depend specifically on, on what technology you're talking about. Yeah, and it's your stance on on because you I, I promised I will get to back to morality. Like if you if we have the morality pill, um, uh, are there also cases when you think about practical ethics when it's not a good idea to have a morality pill, or do you think the net outcome is also always be positive? Well, it depends on what you mean by morality <laughs> and and what the pill actually does. So. If you thought that morality was the obedience of state orders and you had a pill that, you know, compelled people to Mm. obey authority, um, then I think that might be a bad thing. Um, And so making people more obedient and less questioning, um, you know, may be a bad thing given a certain political scenario. Um, so, uh, you know, again, another, another um, you know, case that people often give me is, well, if you made people more altruistic, um, you know, and, and more willing to help and less inclined to be violent, then when violence is necessary to stand up to oppression or, you know, unjust threats. So, you know, an example John Harris has given is um, of a guy called Sharinga, who I think he was Dutch actually, um, who tackled a terrorist on an aeroplane and, and disarmed him and saved mm. the plane. You know, Harris's argument is, well, if we gave him a morality pill that made yeah. him kinder and less willing to harm, you know, maybe that you know, plane would have, would have crashed. And, and I think that if, if a drug just made you not nicer to everyone, regardless of what the, their actions were to you, that, that might not be a moral enhancement. So I wouldn't advocate that. 
but what you want is a drug that enables you to be kinder when kindness is required and, and harsher when harshness is required. So typically you require it to be coupled with capacities around judgments of justice mm. and, or threat. And so the combination of a pill that both enabled you to be kinder but also uh, better able to deliberate about justice <laughs> might be a valuable moral enhancer. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting point you mentioned. I did not think about that before, that it's also when you increase your uh, ability to choose or to, to make a decision and uh, in combination with, uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, and I'm also curious because um, you were born in Austra uh, Australia. Yeah. Uh, and you're now, as I can um, pronounce it correctly, director of the Oxford Uyuro, I would say it, Uyuro? Uyuro. Uyuro, or Uyuro. Or Uyuro. Uyuro, Uyuro, that's also nice with human enhancement. But yeah. Uyuro, Center for Practical Ethics in, uh, in Oxford. Um, so I'm wondering, my question is, uh, and you also travel a lot um, for your work, uh, I think, uh, do you um, come across uh, diff how different countries or cultures look differently at the topic of human enhancement? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, my, my experience is that clearly Americans are much more libertarian and willing to sort of an enhancement culture, um, you know, where particularly in Silicon Valley people are experimenting, you know, with, with low-dose LSD or MDMA or these sorts of drugs. Um, so that, that's a very experimental culture. I think that the Chinese don't have the restrictions that, you know, Western countries have that derive from a Judeo-Christian morality around, you know, modifying human performance and, um, and, and often for collective social goals. Um, so, you know, they don't have a focus on human dignity or human freedom or human, in, you know, human individualism that, that, um, that we have. Um, so, you know, they've been at the forefront of a lot of, of genetic research. Um, you know, so I think that, you know, attitudes towards enhancement do vary across, across cultures. Um, I think that doesn't mean that, 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 that it's just really in the culture's eyes. I don't believe in relativism. I think we should have some universal principles that govern human enhancement. Um, and, you know, I think that the challenge is to, to identify, you know, what, what well-being consists in, what, what would be an, an enhancement of somebody's life to enable them to have a better life and, and what would be a better society, what would be an appropriate moral goal, what what do we owe each other, as Tim Scanlon's book was famously titled. Um, so I think those are two great philosophical challenges and then we need science to, to, to tell us what the risks and benefits of different strategies are. So I think we need a, a, a kind of a philosophy, ethics and science of human enhancement um, and I don't think that we want to just rely on kind of cultural experiments mm, no because then also one country can take better, bigger risks as a country and they can also uh, uh, how do you say it um, gain maybe a competitive advantage in, in certain human enhancement technologies um, i'm also curious uh, um, about um, do you find some science fiction novels or series or uh, movies um, um, have give a, a, a good impression of human possible human enhancement in the future, and also some um, less well known or less well examples. Yeah, I, I I haven't had the time to read or watch science fiction <laughs> movies really in the last couple of decades, um, but I have used several in my teaching. Um, and so the one that everyone sort of talks about is Gattaca, and and I think that's. Um, kind of particularly dis unhelpful dystopian, not, not you know, f movie about genetic enhancement because it it portrays an inevitability about inequality and and, and restriction of freedom that you know isn't necessary, um, and and it's a kind of you know cheesy movie about the human spirit that anyone could go you know into space if they really wanted to and they were just determined enough, but that's just not true um, um so it, it my my favorite actually pop popular movie uh well my two favorites that i've used quite a lot in teaching 
Um, one's an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie called The Sixth Day, which mm. depicts a kind of trajectory of human cloning, starting with cloning of pets, which is going on now, yeah. to, you know, stem cell therapies, but then to full human cloning, not reproductive cloning, but creating copies of, of human beings and, and sort of touches on some of the moral issues of, of that and identity. Um, so I think that's quite a good film. You know, it's obviously got some gratuitous violence, but but it actually is is well done, as, a, as, as is the Terminator sort of series. And the other one is Boys from Brazil that also deals with cloning. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, both Boys from Brazil and, and the Schwarzenegger films have had a lot of input by people who know a lot about the science and the sort of ethical issues, and they raise some of the issues well. Yeah, yeah. How far are we with cloning? Because I always heard that this re- clone, re- cloning primates, for example, humans, is still not allowed and also very difficult. Yeah, I don't think there's been a huge amount of using nuclear transfer to clone human beings or primates, but it, it has been used extensively in agriculture for yeah. non-human animals. Um, but, you know, it's, this is a, another area where I think people need to realise you know, what actually is possible and what the status quo is. We could clone today using a different kind of technology than nuclear transfer. We could, you know, divide a human embryo into identical twins um, after IVF and those would be clones and you can do this, you've been able to do this for, you know, 15 years or more um, very safely, you know, very effectively to, and, and if you froze one of those embryos, you would have identical twins of different ages that, you know, you would have clones of different ages. Mm. Now, some people have proposed that, you know, you could use that second twin as a source of stem cells if the first twin became ill. That raises a lot of ethical issues. Um, but the technology is pop- the technology is here. We And it's, it's interesting that, that this hasn't been done, um, even though... Not for so far we know. As far as we know, there's an Italian uh, kind of reproductive medicine um, specialist, Severino Antonori, that was sort of threatening to do this at one point. But as far as I know, it hasn't been done, but it's not technically very difficult. So, you know, just because we can do something doesn't mean that we always do do it. And I think it's interesting that it's probably that there'll be laws that, regulate this but in many parts of the world there won't be laws and i think it's really that maybe it's just ignorance or maybe it's the sort of ethical environment that we live in yeah uh last two questions or maybe three um because in the netherlands and also sometimes also in other countries in in uh, in europe i also give keynotes about biohacking and i'd say well it's like you say it's important to uh, look at it case by case and see uh, do we want to use it and when and why etc Um, but I sometimes get the pushback from like, well, we have a lot of issues right now. Think about climate change, think about Brexit. So how do you, uh, yeah, how do you answer these kinds of questions? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, I mean, you think about the whole of human history um, and the whole of human future. Um, we really don't know what are going to be the kind of critical junction points of what are going to make, it's going to make a huge amount of difference. And if we, if humans had always concentrated on the problem that they face, even in the next year or five years or 10 years, we'd still be planting potatoes. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I think what you need, like investment, is a diversity of portfolios. You know, you need some attention to the problems of climate change and Brexit or poverty but you also need some attention to radical advances in technology. And, you know, and I think the work that Nick Bostrom's doing at the Future of Man Institute is incredibly important. And he's looking at, you know, the existence of humanity and existential risks, particularly from AI, um, you know, in, in decades' time. And, and I think some people should be working on that. I don't think we should spend all of our money on that. So, you know, I, I think it's just an arrogance of... of you know, it's overconfidence that we know, first of all, what the real problems are and secondly, what the most promising solutions are. And, and you know, I think there there should be, you know, greater investment in blue sky science and, you know, ethics and, and, and 
policy, and but also you know devoting some some attention to targeted funding to solve specific problems that we face now. But this idea that we shouldn't be doing you know self experimentation or biohacking because there's greater problems, I think, you know, is a very oppressive and um, you know overly confident you know view view of of of, of research the future knowledge and the human condition <laughs> i think you know you, you you obviously need to have some priorities but you should also encourage diversity freedom originality and as john stuart mill said experiments in living you know and and experiments on yourself so i i'm i'm in favor of self-experimentation and i think we should be you know now everything has to be a double blind controlled trial aimed at some very common problem that and and I think we should be embracing many different methodologies and, um, and encouraging a sort of much more exploratory, um, you know, approach to, to invention and, and research. And if you... So well done, you're a pioneer. Ah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's what, what the question was intended for. No, <laughs> joking. Um, if you were to be the prime minister or dictator, if you might say, of, of the UK or Australia or another country, uh, how would you facilitate the debate or what, what would you do uh, concerning human enhancement? So let Well, I think the most urgent problem, you know, kind of point and, and, and the most promising point is education of the next generation. And, and I think that, you know, when I don't have to publish papers and, Get grants and, and um, you know, be concerned about reputation and, and, and deliverables and you know impact measures. I think you know I'd like to do more in, in primary and secondary education, and and we're doing a few small things at the moment. But I think ethics education and ethics debate and science debate, um, and and you know, helping the next generation to think better than we do. Um, about ethics and understand science better than we do is the only way. I think, you know, most of us are just too far gone and I don't think there's any real sort of prospect of significant advance, but I think it's got to be the kind of next generation needs much better skills than we're giving them. I and mean, we're still teaching them sort of completely outdated subjects. And, you know, every kid should have to study ethics and philosophy and they should have to have good grounding in science and they should have to have good grounding in understanding human psychology. Um, and I think only that way can you can you have a debate. Um, but you know our problem is, and I think you know the Netherlands is facing this, is we have this crisis of relativism. People believe that you know we should be neutral to all conceptions of the good life. That you know value is in the eye of the beholder. We can't be committed to values. And I think that you know we need to get off the fence and decide what our values are and, and teach them in schools. Um, and enable people to more critically reflect for themselves and develop those values. But, you know, I think that, you know, a value-based ethics education, philosophical education is, you know, one of the major planks of, of creating the, the sort of environment for, for that sort of um, discussion, debate, policy and engagement with the future. Nice answer. And also to, uh, for the last question, uh, if you still have the chance for the, the people that are listening or watching that are, uh, well, in the age that they are, what you say, uh, too far out, uh, if you have one question to ask them or one thing they can wonder about or what would you ask of them? Or what do they think a good life is for themselves? I mean, one of the things I learned from philosophy when I started, which was just so exciting, was there was so much to think about, about what you should be doing even just with your own life, let alone, you know, what sort of moral person should you be? That's another good question to ask yourself. But, you know, I think my view of ethics is, is not a missionary position, to put it that way, of converting people to a certain sort of way of life or set of values. It's about trying to give people the skills, a Socratic view of ethics that enables them to engage in dialogue and work out for themselves. You know, what sort of life should I be living? Um, what should my goals be? What sort of moral person should should I be eating meat? Should I be giving more to charity? Should I be engaging more in research um, as a research participant? Um, should I be making my data available? 
But then, you know, also, you know, what am I aiming for? Am I aiming for happiness? Then there's a whole science of happiness. Do I think there are certain things which are just, you know, that are worth doing that I ought to do with my life? Or am I just going to decide, you know, what's my strongest desire and go in that direction? And, you know, there are 2,000 years or more of philosophy on these topics. And, you know, I, for me, studying philosophy and ethics has been extremely liberating and I'm still trying to answer those questions for myself. And it's hard enough answering them for yourself, let alone telling somebody else what to do. So I think, you know, it's like as Jesus said, you should take the um, plank out of your own eye before you take the splinter out of somebody else's. And so I think you should start to look at your own life and, you know, what, what values you stand for, what life, you know, when you look back from your deathbed where you say my life was a good one. I once asked Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize for um, economics but actually is a psychologist and studied human psychological limitations and biases, you know, what do you think the most important piece of advice to give people to um, live a better life would be? And he said, think about you, your death and the, the limitations of your life as a, as, a, as a fixed resource. He said most people don't think, pe people think of their life as this unending thing, that they never have to plan uh, or they never have to sort of allocate. And, you know, I think that's exactly right. You should, you know, realise that you know, you're not, not going to be here forever. Human enhancement, unfortunately, is not going to unravel quickly enough for us to sort of have these, you know, transhumanist <laughs> lives. And, you know, we better get on and decide what we want those lives to be. Nice answer and a nice end to this interview. Professor Julian Savalescu, thank you very much. Thank you.